thank everyone for coming. So we're just going to have a, a, a hopefully not too long presentation. And I'll try to, hopefully it's very interesting. Um, we're going to talk about how we invest, how we find investments, uh, three examples of things that we own in the portfolio. And um, if you can ask about more things later in the Q&A, how we communicate to our investors and in uh, Q&A, and then we can go have some food and beer and wine outside. So just a little bit about me for people who don't know me that well. My name is Marcelo Lima. I run the Heller House Opportunity Fund. Uh, we started in 2010. And it's one fund and one institutional managed account. Uh, and we, the idea is to be very, very flexible, unconstrained, have an open mind. The only constraint that we really have is we have to invest in publicly traded companies or securities. And the goal is really to find exceptional businesses that we can own, uh, have the mentality of a, of a business owner, and just hold those businesses for as long as possible a multi-year period ideally, and just let compounding do the work for us. Our mission is, is to deliver investment excellence to our investors, and that means doing better than the market over the long run. And we have a very strong alignment of interests. So I have all of my money in the fund, and my family has most of its net worth in the fund as well, and so that's an unusual level of alignment of interests that we have with, with our investors. You know, in this line of work, it's very important to be, I, I learned this, uh, I think it it's, it's becomes more and more true uh, the more I learn about the business and, and about the world, it's just very important to be open-minded um, and, and to be able to explore new ideas, new business models, um, uh, and, and really be attuned and open to new empires being created. And we'll see later on in the presentation what that means. Now, it's a, it's a nice balance, right, because it does not mean jumping into the latest fad or the latest bandwagon just because something is new and sexy. Uh, it, it means, it, what it means instead is, is, is being open to new things and to understanding new things. And we're going to see why that's so important. Uh, so a few guiding principles that these are uh, a few phrases that I have engraved in my brain uh, that, I've, that I've collected over the years. This one is by the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen. He has this idea of strong opinions but loosely held, right? Which is a bit of a paradox. So you want to have, you want to have a point of view because if you don't have a point of view, you can't do anything. But you want to also be able to get rid of that point of view if you learn something new or if, if the facts change. Uh, I love this phrase. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few, right? This is you also want to have. This is also a bit of a paradox because you, you need expertise to understand a field and a business and an industry well, but you also have to keep this very flexible mind and think like a beginner at all times. You know, Charlie Munger has this idea that if, if a year goes by and you don't throw away one of your best held ideas, it's a wasted year. I love that. And, and Jeff Bezos expresses this with this idea of it's always day one, right? Which is kind of like this idea of perpetual beta. You're always hustling, you're always um, you're always uh, trying to adapt and, and, and thinking of, of new ways to do things. You know, and, and so you come to this thought that the world is so complex that you, you really have to have this ability to change your mind because if you don't, you're really underestimating how, how complex the world actually is. So with all of this in mind, right, how do we, how do we actually invest? So I want to just go back a little bit and, and think, uh, you know, everything that I, that I do, I try to think from first principles. So I like to think about business as something that lives on top of this world and what causes uh, businesses to, to rise and fall and wealth to be created. Let's look over the past few thousand years. Uh, this is on the, on the uh, x-axis you have, you know, from beginning of time, if you will, beginning of history until recent times. And basically, there's no wealth created, right? We, were, we had um, horse-drawn wagons and bows and arrows and you know, a few things getting invented later on. But then you start getting this slight inflection. And it really starts around the 1700s. And so why, what happened there, right? Obviously, the Industrial Revolution. But it wasn't one thing. It was a collection of things. And all these technologies and innovations together created this incredible 
explosion in wealth. So you get to north of $100 trillion of, of global wealth, right? And I don't know how they measure this, but uh, it's got to be a huge number, especially relative to, to what it was before. And this is basically standards of living, right? Standards of living were rising almost nothing, and then all of a sudden you saw this huge explosion. So this is a picture of human ingenuity, human invention, capitalism, competition, and what happened, right? So let's, let's look at some key innovations, and this is ordered by date, and this is a very selective list. So starting in the 1700s, you had steam power, agriculture, iron making, etc. All of these technologies that they fed on each other, and they conspired to create all this growth and wealth that we've had. Now, you know, these things are, are dependent on each other, right? You had steam power, and you, you, once you invented that, you could use the steam power to improve iron making. Once you had decent iron making, you could then make machine tools, which are these, these, these tools that you use to make more, more tools and more machines and more machine parts. Once you had that, you could make the internal combustion engine, which then led to the automobile and the airplane, the jet airplane, et cetera. Um, so eventually, of course, we get to the personal computer and the internet and the iPhone, and that all lives on top of innovations that came before, like the electrification of, of the grid. Now, wouldn't it be amazing, right? You see all this wealth created. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could own a royalty on this wealth creation? If you could own a piece of that huge curve? Well, that's exactly our job, right? That's what we're, we're looking for, is owning a royalty on incredible innovations from here onwards. And this process of innovation, if you think about those items uh, in that list, it's really about taking something that was scarce and expensive and making it cheap and abundant. And technology does this over and over and over again. So transportation, you had uh, railroads and cars and airplanes making travel go from expensive and scarce to abundant and cheap. Uh, you had steam power, internal combustion engine, electricity making motive power go from very expensive and, and scarce to abundant and cheap. So it's something that you see over and over again. Now, each one of those names goes through this adoption curve, right? Something gets invented, and then it takes many years for that innovation to get adopted throughout society. So if we look at the automobile, for example, this is on the y-axis is percent of US, the US population that has an automobile. So 1915, you're roughly 10% penetrated. Today, about 90% penetrated. Then you can sort of speculate what happened here, right? You had Great Depression and Second World War. This is another curve, the electric, electric grid, electrification in the United States. Again, nobody had electricity at one point, and then now everybody does. This is the household refrigerator. It's fun to think that people might be willing to give up their cars during the war, but not their refrigerators. Color TV, and of course these things all depend on each other, right? You couldn't get TV without, let's say, electricity. The landline got fully adopted and then came down, and you can sort of think about why people started cutting their landline. The internet, cell phones, and social media. And these are just a few curves, like this thing could be very busy. If we had all the curves in there, there's, and of course there's, there's an infinite number of them. But um, you know, I highlighted the internet for a reason. And the reason is, it really changed, it, it was very revolutionary. And the reason it was revolutionary is, it turned software dis distribution into a zero marginal cost proposition. Again, you know, again turning something that was scarce and expensive into something that's cheap and abundant. And that matters because you know, software is eating the world, right, in the words of Mark Andreessen. And so as more and more things around us get consumed or taken over by software, the fact that the internet enables this distribution at zero marginal cost really, really changes the game for businesses everywhere. And of course, it hurts a lot of incumbents. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. This is a remarkable slide from Johnson & Johnson which is a company that started at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, sort of the middle maybe, uh, in the 1800s. And it was an innovator at the time. 
but now this slide was from early 2008 and literally the slide before this it said we are getting disrupted and so here they have all the things that we j johnson and johnson used to be unique at these are all the reasons we're no longer unique and on the right hand uh right column all the guys who are disrupting us so for example we used to attract the best talent but now anybody can go to linkedin and find the best talent you know we used to be able to build brands but now people are building brands on instagram and youtube you know we used to have this grip on distribution but now people go to can anybody can sell anything on amazon and when you think about it this is this really permeated the world in, in the way that it, it destroyed a lot of the advantages of so many companies. I'll give you an example, Procter & Gamble, right? They make Tide detergent. Now think back 50, 60 years ago, you would watch primetime TV. There were maybe three TV channels. Everybody watched primetime TV. They would give you an advertisement for Tide detergent. You had the brand impression. Then you walk into the supermarket. It's the only place you could buy detergent. And you had that recall, the brand recall. Oh, I remember this. Oh, well, apparently it does a really good job at cleaning. Why don't I buy it? And that's it. Profit for Procter & Gamble. Well, the internet, think about it, destroyed each one of those steps. First of all, you have an explosion of media, and the eyeballs are all over the place. People are on Facebook, they're on Instagram, they're on Netflix. They're not watching primetime TV anymore. Secondly, the shelf space that Procter & Gamble would pay slotting fees for, and they had the end cap, well, that's infinite. You can shop online, and Procter & Gamble doesn't control that anymore. And then the whole, and this has enabled the rise of a lot of new digital native brands, brands that are sort of born in the age of the internet. They advertise through influencers on Instagram and viral videos on YouTube, and it's really hurting these companies. So it's really, really challenging. And I don't know if there's, there's much that they can do. Now, you might ask yourself, where are we in this process of the internet being adopted, right? A lot of people think, I've talked to people and some are like, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's everywhere, everybody has it. But that's, it's really actually not true. So this is internet penetration by population. This is sub-Saharan Africa, it's 20% penetrated. And this is just internet not broadband, South Asia. Globally, we're at less than 50% penetrated, which is kind of astonishing. Middle East and North Africa, East Asian Pacific, Latin America, Caribbean, all under 60%. Europe and Central Asia, under 80%. North America, under 80%. And I picked one that was like the highest one I could find, which is Iceland. Right? If you have a very small island nation, I guess it's very easy to... Maybe it's <laughs> Maybe, for sure. Um, now think, and this is just internet, it's just, you know, it's not even broadband. And, and this matters because as we saw in, the, uh, in, in, in that list of technologies, it's not when you have one thing that you, you get this dramatic uh, shift in, in wealth, it's when you have a lot of things that, that are built on top of each other. And so we can only imagine all the things that will get built on top of an internet that everybody has access to, or on top of broadband that everybody has access to. Of course, there's that saying, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And those of us who live in advanced economies already have a lot of these innovations. So with all of this as backdrop, let's think about this idea of capturing a royalty on, on all this wealth creation. And let's look at the companies that did it and, and how they, how, you know, which, which ones were the big winners. So this is a list of the, the biggest wealth creators in the US stock market over the past 90 years, ending in 2016. And so you can start looking at this list and you can think, well, I know that guy, right, Exxon Mobil. That's an oil company, a trillion dollars in lifetime wealth creation. This is stock price, appreciation plus dividends. And, okay, oil, that's, they rode this amazing uh, automobile adoption curve that we saw, and all forms of transportation, they use oil and petrochemicals and all that. But then it's kind of surprising, you see Apple as number two. That's a pretty new company in this 90 year time span. Right? That's like personal computers and iPhone. And then you see you can electricity, General Electric, You've got brands, cigarettes, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, 
Walmart, Procter & Gamble's there, so another new company, Amazon, or a recent company, Coca-Cola, Telephone, remember the, the landline adoption curve, AT&T is there. Now, of course, this list goes on and on and on, and there's you know, a, a, a thousand of these companies that generated all the net wealth over the past 90 years, but this gives you a sense of, of what it means to ride this adoption curve over, over many years. You get to build a lot of wealth. Right? Wouldn't it be awesome to be that guy who bought, let's say, ExxonMobil at the beginning of the company uh, when it was Standard Oil and, and just held on for, for 90 years? Um, it's also interesting to look at this list and, and imagine, well, you know, a lot of these companies are obviously getting disrupted or, or not going to be <laughs> huge wealth creators over the next decade or, or, or so. Like, I, I, I bet nobody in this room if you had to choose, would choose to be a shareholder of ExxonMobil, right? Amongst all these, all these other choices. So let's look at this process. You know, uh, so there's this process of disruption, and we have, you know, it, it's a common word. It, there's like an actual academic meaning, meaning to it. But there's, uh, you know, everybody knows these examples from, from history. Cars came along and disrupted uh, you know, the wagon and the carriage, boogie whips, etc. Digital photography killed Kodak. Music downloads killed the music bundle, CDs, albums, et cetera. Netflix killed Blockbuster, now Uber, Lyft are potentially, you know, have already disrupted the taxi medallion monopoly, potentially even car ownership one day. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this, right? So this disruptive, inno disruptive, disruptive innovation process, what does it mean? So broadly speaking, there's two types of disruption. There's low end disruption, which is there's an existing company and I come along, I invent a better mousetrap, but it's cheaper. It's not as good, perhaps. But I start taking over the customers of the existing company that are overserved. Right? These are sort of low-hanging fruit for me. But then I iterate, I get better, and I move up, uh, I move up market, and I end up getting more and more of those existing customers. So this is a process that it competes with existing consumption. There's already consumption of that good or service in the market. And the existing companies have this motivation to just move up market. Now, new market disruption is the other type, and this is when you create a whole new market for something that didn't exist before. In this case, you're competing with non-consumption, and the incumbents don't even know you're coming. Right? So with this framework, we can sort of think of all these companies that over the past, you know, since 1870, and we can put them on this spectrum of new market disruption to low-end disruption, and of course some of them are hybrids. So it's interesting to see the names, right? Kodak at one point was a disruptive innovator. So was Bell Telephone, which became AT&T, Ford Motors. McDonald's, think about it, right? In the 1950s, it was cheap food, it was fast. That was very disruptive. And so the, the lesson from this chart for me is you, you know, a lot of these companies that today are, are mature and have, are at the end of, the, of that adoption curve and are slow growing perhaps, were at some point uh, you know, sexy, high growth companies that were disruptive innovators. And then at the bottom of the curve, you see companies that are still doing, uh, still doing very well at the bottom of the chart. And, and they're doing so because they're still uh, they're still, they still have a lot of that adoption curve ahead of them, right? They still have that market growth uh, that they almost get for free. Now, it's, it's amazing to, to think how, um, just how quickly things change, uh, you know, and we, we don't notice it because it happens gradually, but then you look back and this is 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, I would go back uh, to, to spend some time with my parents over, over vacation and this was state of the art at the time, right? And, and this thing, you couldn't even text on this thing. All you could do was make phone calls. And then boom, you know, 20 years, and we have this astonishing device in our hands that can do high resolution videos, photos, you can shop on it, you can see maps, you can talk to anyone, communicate in any way you want. It's just, it's kind of amazing. You know, Bill Gates has this line that we overestimate the change in two years, but we underestimate the change in 10. So the lesson here is when we invest, we, we have to imagine the world 
not it is, as it is today, but we have to sort of try to look a little bit into the future and think about how the world will be configured in a few years. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that these companies didn't exist even 10 years ago, right? These are, you know, Instagram, I, the iPad, you know, Lyft, uh, WhatsApp, et cetera. And a lot of these, uh, I bet a lot of people in this room use one or more of these on a daily basis. So there's this very useful concept from startup investing that is also very useful for us. So it's called product market fit. And it's when you have your, your product meets a market that's very receptive to it and, and it just takes off. So you want to have that great market because if you, if you have a great market, it just pulls product out of the company. And it's important for us because our companies have you know, incredible research and development efforts and visionary founders. And if, you don't, if, you, if you're not operating in a great market, it's just not going to work, right? If you have a lousy market, you're going to fail. It doesn't matter what, how great your product is. Now, this is a picture of product market fit. This is a company I'm sure everybody knows. It's called Instagram. And uh, it was um, started in 2010, had a million users. And then it, went, it just went parabolic. This is like 1,000x in, in eight years. It's amazing, right? A billion users. It was acquired by Facebook when it had 50 million people for $1 billion in 2012. And it's, um, some people think it might, might be worth up to $100 billion today. So that's one heck of an acquisition. So this is, you have great market, great product. You're riding these adoption curves, adoption curve of the internet, the smartphone, uh, social media. You have a great team, right? So you have the, the entire combination of, of great things that you want in a business. So with all this, how do we actually, uh, how do we find these, these investments? Well, this is sort of um, our, our, our filter. We look for, for businesses that have global scale or that can, can have global scale and that operate in, in great markets, hopefully markets that are also growing. We look for franchises. A franchise is a, a product or service that's needed by customers, has no close substitutes, and has unregulated pricing. So you want that sort of that con consumer staple, if you will. And of course, it, it will have demonstrated product market fit. And when you have product market fit, cash just piles up in your bank account, right? Because your sales are very strong. The dog is eating the dog food, right? Customers love it. We also want businesses that are riding one or more of these technological adoption curves. This is important because you almost get growth for free because your markets are growing. And there's a lot of, um, well, there's academic research showing that shareholder returns are highly correlated with revenue growth and high returns on invested capital. And so we want that as well, which brings me to my next point, which is a competitive advantage, which gives you that high return on invested capital. We want wide moats in our companies. Now, the, you know, the moat is something that protects the castle. So you can think of our business as an economic castle. And it has this protection from competition. And that could be, could come in many forms, like network effects, patents, could be regulatory, could be barriers to entry. And every day we're getting a little bit better or worse, right? Uh, all of us. Same thing is true for businesses. So we want to have the direction of the moat be one that is widening every day. We don't want moats that are narrowing. This one, is, this is a very interesting image. It's, it's the famous Amazon flywheel. So the, the story here is that uh, Jim Collins, uh, who's a well-known business book uh, author and thinker and consultant, King uh, wrote a book called Good to Great. And before he published it, he visited Amazon. And he told the Amazon team about the flywheel that he was going to write about in the book. And Jeff Bezos saw that and he's like, I love this idea. So he sketched out Amazon's flywheel. And it's a reinforcing cycle, right? You have, you have let's have, as Amazon, let's have a low cost structure. 
and this will enable us to lower our prices, which is going to create better customer service, a better customer experience. It's going to attract more traffic to our website. That's going to bring on more sellers to the Amazon marketplace, which improves selection and sort of becomes a self-fulfilling, this, this virtuous circle. And it's funny because once Bezos wrote down this, uh, you know, drew this diagram, there were executives uh, who worked with him who said, oh, great. I've been working here five years. I finally understand how our business works, right? Because it was so insightful. And so we want this. We want an aspect of this in our businesses, some sort of network effect, this, this uh, improving virtuous circle. It's very important. We also want, we talked about this, reinvestment opportunities. Companies uh, think about it in terms of they, they sell things, right? They get all this money from customers, and then they have to pay whatever it costs to produce that good or service. And they have to pay their employees. They have to pay for office. They have all these expenses, but then they have cash left at the end of the day. And what do you do with it? You, ideally, we want businesses that can consume that cash into new research and development efforts, into capital expenditures, into, into new ventures that create high returns on capital. So that's the ideal business. And that comes hand in hand with a strong balance sheet. We also want to invest in companies that have missionaries at the helm, not mercenaries. So a mercenary, uh, and I'm thinking back to that Johnson & Johnson slide, because at that conference, I saw a bunch of consumer packaged goods companies. And these are no longer founder-led companies. right? These companies were founded in 1870, a lot of them. So this is like whatever generation of professional management team is there, and they have a board of directors. and. You know, they hired a professional guy, and the guy has certain metrics that he has to, to abide by. And, and a lot of these guys, their only incentive is, you know what, I'm going to manage earnings per share. It's going to go up a little bit every year. And then in the seventh year, I'm going to get my big bonus and retire. And that's all I care about. Right? He, he's not thinking about this, you know, I have, to, I have to make this business competitive for the next 20 years. The missionary, on the other hand, the guy has a mission, right? He's, he wants to build the most incredible business he possibly can. He wants to make this a, uh, just a franchise over, over the next 50 to 100 years. That's how, that's how a lot of these missionaries think. The other thing that's important about this is if you are this, the best and brightest of your age cohort, you're like, you know, either you're graduating from college or you're not graduating from college, but you're, you're, you're among the top 5% of humanity, right? And you can go pick anywhere you want to go work. Are you going to go work at a boring, slow-growing, you know, mature company with a mercenary management team that doesn't inspire you? Or are you going to go work at these very exciting teams that have a visionary at the helm? Right? Obviously, it's going to be the latter. So these companies tend to attract much better talent. And there's this additional filter that I really like, which is you know, if I'm going to invest in a company, it's got to be a company that I would want to work at and receive my entire compensation in stock. I think it really focuses the mind, right? Because if I want to receive my entire compensation in stock, it means that I really want to be associated with this company. And of course, valuation really matters. It really matters what you pay. It doesn't matter how amazing a business is if you pay too much for it. So we have this conceptual framework of the discounted cash flow. You pay some money at the beginning. You hold the investment over several years. And we want to hold it for as long as we possibly can. We want to have that 90-year hold period with the greatest wealth creation, ideally, right, if we could. Uh, and we have this hurdle when we underwrite these investments of at least 20% compounded, right? At least 20% on a compounded basis per annum. So three quick examples of things that we own that fulfill all of our criteria. The first one you probably guessed, it's Amazon. So this is sales from the beginning of the company until, until recently. And people think Amazon is big. You know, Sometimes people are, oh, but how much more can they grow? Well, the pace of growth is it's still growing sales around you know, north of 20%. It's only 5% of retail sales in the US. And they're still, they still have a lot of space to grow outside the US. But I want to talk a bit about a business inside Amazon that is, I think, poorly understood. 
and which is really a juggernaut, and that's Amazon Web Services, which by the way is, is sort of this, this little, this is Amazon Web Services over here. So it's, it's kind of small in the grand scheme of things, but it's very high margin and it's going very fast. Now, this is a little bit low res, I apologize, but I wanted to show you the, the size, I'll explain what Amazon Web Services is, but I wanted to show you this, their network. So, the best way to think about them, I think, is to go back to the days of electricity, when electricity was being deployed. And back then, remember it was, this is like 18, whatever, 90, it was a manufacturing economy, we used to make widgets, there was no software obviously, and factories needed uh, motive power to get their machines working and, and to, to sort of build things. And this motive power came from maybe a river. There was a river nearby and it turned a wheel and there was a shaft and the shaft went inside the factory and that turned another wheel and created the motive power for, for the factory. Then along came steam power and replaced that and then finally electricity. So factories everywhere were building their own power plants next to the factories. It was all this machine. So in the early 1900s, this entrepreneur named uh, Sam Insull, he said, you know what? I, I can see the future and it's gonna be a centralized power station, very efficient, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have scale so it's gonna be cheaper and better than everything else that everybody has. And I'm just gonna run a wire from my power station to all these different factories. So he starts knocking on people's doors and saying, listen, I can replace all this equipment that you have, all these engineers, all, these, all this expense, and you can just buy power from me, it's gonna be super reliable and cheap. And that was the birth of the centralized power utility industry. Now, AWS is doing exactly the same thing for computation. But there's one key difference. Whereas the electric power plant sells a commodity, just an electron, AWS sells hundreds of differentiated products. Everything from computer storage to databases, to machine learning algorithms, to translation services, to transcription, and you know, and on and on and on and on. So today, any company, big or small, whether you're a startup or whether you're a, a very large enterprise that's currently spending hundreds of millions of dollars in, in IT, anybody can go migrate or get started on AWS for next to nothing. And it, it revolutionizes the, the process of innovation. You can literally get started just uh, instantly, previously companies, let's say a company wants to innovate in software, it needs to go and buy the, the hardware, and it takes months and many levels of approval, you gotta talk to your boss, and it costs millions of dollars to buy all the computers, get them installed, et cetera. Now an engineer can literally go on AWS, it's, it's through the browser, you log in, and for like a dollar or two, you immediately start prototyping something. And at your fingertips, you have a fleet of millions of computers doing whatever it is that you want them to do. It's really completely revolutionary. This is a, uh, a $30 billion revenue run rate business growing 45% a year with very high margins. Given the size of the industry and the penetration, meaning if you look at industry revenues, it's maybe 50 to 60 billion today. The total addressable market is probably a trillion. You know, we're about five to 6% penetrated, so it's very early days. I think within a decade, this business can be bigger than all of Amazon is today. So it's, it's really remarkable. And their pace of innovation, by the way, is astonishing. So I've been to a few of their conferences. This is a screenshot from one of the keynotes at the conference. And so there's several keynotes and there's several events and you, you can, there's literally a catalog, like, like a university catalog of over 1,200 different sessions you can attend. It's five days, it's, it's just an incredible uh, event. And it's just, it, it's exhausting to just watch these guys present all the innovations. I can even imagine what it feels like to be a competitor of these guys. So just to close the loop, this is Peter DeSantis showing, this is where we have data centers all around the world. They call them availability zones. And those white lines are fiber optic cables that a lot of them owned by Amazon. So the AWS will literally go and put a fiber optic cable underwater as part of their, their infrastructure. So they, you know, as, when you talk about having a moat, these guys are digging the moat, literally, right? This is a really remarkable business. And by the way, it's, uh, I feel it's very misunderstood because I talk to people about it and I get, uh, the, the biggest reaction I get is that it's a commodity 
Uh, I even got that recently from a, a very well-known software executive that I ran into at a conference. Uh, and then he told me, look, but once we started using it, we realized this is a very powerful business and it's anything but a commodity. But it takes, it takes some work to get there. The next company, now that I explained what AWS is, you'll understand this one. This is AWS for telecommunications. So AWS gives you hundreds of functions for computer storage, databases, etc. Twilio gives you all those functions for anything that you want to do that used to involve you know, copper wires and PBX boxes and things like that. It's turned all of that into software. So you want to make a phone ring, it's a few lines of code. You want to send a text message, it's a few lines of code. It's, it's, it's really, it's been a revolution in, in telecommunications. And so I'll give you some use cases. Let's say you, uh, you log on to your bank and your bank says, oh, let me send you a text message to make sure it's really you and you can type that code in. Well, that's powered by Twilio. Or you call your Uber driver and it's, it's masked, right? It's not really your phone number or when he calls you, it's not his phone number. And then when you send him a text message, the same thing happens. That masking of the phone number is done by Twilio. And I'm just giving you two examples in a universe of, of things that this company uh, can, can enable. And, and by the way, they don't build the functionality. They just give you the building blocks and then people just build whatever they want on top of it. So what's amazing is Twilio saw people building entire call centers on top of Twilio using these building blocks. And then they said, you know what? This is a huge market. Why don't we build, why don't we build our own uh, call center, uh, app, they call it APIs, application programming interface, our own functions for call centers. And they did that and it's called Twilio Flex. And it's been, uh, it, it went general availability last year and it's just this incredible, incredible uh, innovation. Allows you to, to, I saw the demo, you can literally deploy a call center within two minutes and it's, the price is incredibly disruptive. So this chart here, by the way, shows the typical customer journey. So I say so you sign on to Twilio and you start, you log on and you start building something and you're not spending anything with them. But then as you test the product and then finally you launch it, anything, any click that you do, any, any, any um, uh, text message that gets sent, any phone call that gets made, they make some money and all of a sudden the customer is doing more than 100,000 a month. The last company is probably one that you've seen around. This is um, the iconic, the maker of the iconic uh, uh, point of sale called Square. And, but that's just a piece of the, of the ecosystem, right? They, make a, they do a lot more than just the point of sale. They have an entire suite of software around the point of sale things like payroll for small businesses, uh, things like managing, managing all types of businesses like restaurants. Um, they have the Square card, which allows you to, as soon as you make a sale, the money shows up in, in this free uh, debit card with your name on it, and you can start spending right away. They have the Cash app, which you know, had 15 million users in December, which was twice as much as the year before. Uh, and you know, these companies that I showed you are, you know, Revenues are just growing, going through the roof. You know, Twilio last quarter grew revenue 70%, north of 70%. Square is running north of 40%. These markets are very large, right? The market for, uh, for telecommunications uh, that Twilio is, is, is in is potentially a trillion dollars plus. Same thing for Square, that's you know, several trillion dollars in terms of um, personal consumer spending and payments industry and electronification of, of payments. So these are very, very large markets. And these companies are all mission driven and, and, and have all the attributes that we seek. So how, how do we, you know, what job are we doing for you, right? Heller House, what job is Heller House doing for you as an investor? Well, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, the way I see it is people have buckets of, of capital in their portfolio. So they might have cash for, uh, for a, a rainy day they might have something a little bit more, that yields a little bit more than cash, maybe a bond fund. Um, we want to be the, the part of your portfolio that is the most different from, from cash and bonds. We want to be sort of the, the most aggressively growing and long duration part of your portfolio. And that means something that will compound your money over many, many years, 10, 20 years plus. Um, and that really can grow your wealth uh, as fast as possible. And you know, in our efforts to, to do this, you know, we're always looking for, for new partners 
new investors. Um, and, and so if you, if you like the presentation, feel free to talk to me afterwards, or if you have friends that you think would like it, um, same. So, um, you know, we communicate with our investors. We, uh, frequently we have these very detailed quarterly letters that are sometimes run 20 pages and explain a lot of these things that I just said. Uh, we have a blog um, that, I, that I recently started. This is uh, one of the recent posts. You can subscribe there. And uh, I even did a podcast recently. This is a podcast interview on Amazon with my friend uh, Eric Schlein. Just one last thing before we, we break for Q&A. Um, you know, this, I, I hold these, these values very deeply, is, is this ability to keep learning. Uh, as, as we saw, you know, if you saw that list of innovations of the 17, 1700s, 1800s, if you were around back then investing and you're like, you know what, this railroad stuff is too high tech, I'm not going to think about it. Or, you know, this Ford Motors thing, I don't want to think about that. Or General Motors, like the world just passes you by, right? So you have to be willing to tackle new business models and new ideas. This relentless focus um, on, on, on the portfolio, on the companies that we own, I spend a lot of time traveling. Uh, a lot, a lot more than I used to, to visit our companies. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley, attending user conferences, developer conferences. I have, I think, uh, uh, a little bit of an advantage there because I used to be a computer programmer for four years after college. So I ran my own Linux box, I ran my own uh, MySQL database, and so I can speak the language and and and, and I understand sort of the technical aspects of this a little bit better. Um, you know, it goes hand in hand with this in-depth research and conviction. You know, when, when, when uh, you know, prices fluctuate all the time, things are very volatile. So when prices go down, we can really take advantage when we have conviction in the things that we own. And we're fully invested, which I think is, is, a, is a feature because we don't get paid to hold cash on behalf of our investors. And we're, we're small enough that if we can't find things to do, I don't think we're doing our jobs. And we have this very unique, I think, alignment of interests where you know, all of my money is in the fund and my, my family has the majority of its assets in the fund as well. So with that, um, we can break for, for Q&A. One last thing, um, if, you, if you haven't used Twitter yet, uh, I think it's one of the most amazing learning and discovery platforms ever. I've, I, I've learned a tremendous amount. And if you follow, the, I'm not saying that I'm one of the right people to follow, but if you follow the right people, so I've curated uh, the people that I follow, and so it's like drinking from a fire hose of, uh, of, of just incredible people. You know, Bill Gurley is a famous venture capitalist. Recently, he gave a talk, and he said, uh, he said the top, you know, the top 20% of people in any given field are on Twitter, and if you're not, if you're not there, you're missing out. And I think he's absolutely right about that. So um, our investor materials, um, all the documents about the fund are at hellerhs.com slash invest if you want to take a look. And I would love to answer the questions that you have been preparing over the course of this presentation. So you can just ask and I'll repeat. Go ahead. So can you talk a little bit about the concentration of your investments in terms of companies and concentration in tech? specific companies as opposed to how the fund used to be the yep. four years ago that you were part Yeah, so concentration in general and then concentration in tech today. Um, also, we're very concentrated. We, we have maybe 25 positions, it changes a little bit, um, but it's very top heavy. The largest position is 20% of the fund. and I, I'm a big fan of the Kelly criterion for position sizing, which means you measure the probability and the size of the downside, and you measure the probability and the size of the upside. Of course, you can't look up the probability in a table somewhere. You have to estimate these things. And so the big positions are the ones that I think are very safe, but still have a lot of upside. The s very small positions are things that uh, are, I'm starting to buy, and it's price dependent, it's research dependent, it's sort of fact driven whether I'm going to size it up or not. Um, of course, the 20% position started out as a 1% position, you know, a while back. So that's how they all start. As far as 
focus on technology, I'm a big fan of this. Uh, I understand exactly what you mean by that. It's, it's information technology, it's software, it's that, it's that industry. I like this very broad definition of technology, which is uh, from Clay Christensen. So he says technology, all it is, is, is capital, people, and ideas put together to create value. And so, you know, the uh, Ford Motors was, was, was an innovative technology. The wheel was, a, was an amazing technology thousand years ago or whatever, when the wheel was, in, was invented. Um, so I'm open, you know, we have a lot of stuff in software, we have a lot of stuff in, in, uh, in information technology, yes. Uh, but I'm very open to any types of technology and as long as I can, you know, which I, part of the learning is you have to dive deep and learn about it, etc. Uh, so it, that's the positioning right now. It's very concentrated in information technology. But again, I think that that's a feature, not a bug, because I, I'm a big believer in benefiting from these amazing tailwinds that we talked about, right? And leaning heavily into that. And if you have an advantage in understanding these companies, then I think it's, it's even better to be exposed to that. Yeah, Sam, go ahead, Andre. Can you elaborate more on um, the decision four years ago to switch um, from being more global in nature to more domestic? Um, what, what, what caused that epiphany or, or what motivated that decision? And, um, as you look at these software innovations, you know, there's lots of stuff happening in other geographies. How are you thinking about that and, and, and that type of disruption? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So it's, uh, it's about moving the portfolio from not being in tech to be in tech and from being international to being less international. It's, it's just everything is, is this bottom up process that this is where we end up, right? So uh, there, they, I agree with you and, and we do have, uh, we have one international, we have two international software investments in the portfolio. It just happens that, you know, Silicon Valley being what it is, uh, there's just a lot more of them here. As far as this transition from this total change in mindset, I mean, I, I was going through periods where I would go home and, and tell my wife Jezebel, I'm overwhelmed, because I was going through this period of, of such quick learning. And by the way, I still feel that way. It's not a good day for me if I don't have the feeling at the end of the day that I'm like, I'm hitting myself in the head and I'm like, oh, I wish I knew now I wish I knew this morning what I know now, right? That's, that's a good feeling for me. It's a good day for me because it, it means I'm stretching and I'm learning. And it was, it, that period of transitioning was, was really overwhelming because we've, uh, for good or bad, a lot of us and, and have been, I think, brainwashed uh, in, a, in a way against, maybe biased against looking at technology and looking at things that are supposedly more stable. But I think that that's a flawed uh, assumption. As we saw, a lot of the companies that, that we thought were stable, like a Johnson & Johnson, are the ones getting disrupted now. So understanding the process of disruption, understanding the history of technology, understanding how these things happen, that was a big learning process. And that led me to, uh, to these new ideas. Because I said, OK, I have, to, I have to study who's doing the disruption. And once I did, I realized, what incredible businesses these were. And then once you figure out how to value these things, then it becomes a no-brainer in my mind. Sorry, Andre had a question. Yeah, I guess thinking back on your talking about value, right, valuations. So um, to what extent, and going back to the AWS um, kind of uh, cloud computing thesis. Um, so two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, how do you figure out if that's already priced in to, uh, to the current price of, of the security um, in terms of making sure that you're not, again, buying, buying high above the curve. And the second question is, if, to what extent do you believe that, well, this, this investment thesis, you know, you should be able to also make positions in other companies investing in that same technology, like Microsoft um, and, and Google and Alibaba? Yeah, yeah, great question. So how do you know that it's something's not already priced into the stock, right? If it's, if it's uh, and then if it's growing and it's, I guess the implication is that it's, uh, it's a well-diffused information that people know about. And then the second question is, uh, how about the other guys doing public clouds like Alibaba and, and, and uh, Azure and, and Google? So you know, the valuation question, 
I, I'm very much a, I'm very much a fan of models of having financial models. So every company that we invest in has a financial model, and every model has several scenarios for margins and whether the growth is going to be higher or lower. And that's a big change, by the way. I used to not underwrite growth. I used to be of this mentality that, oh, I'm a value investor, and therefore I'm unwilling to invest in growth. I, I'm buying something at 10 times earnings, and if I get growth, it's like it's gravy, right? And I just think that that's wrong because you have to look for growth. If you don't look for growth, you end up with uh, you end up investing in these things that are very mature and that are going sideways and that lack all these very attractive characteristics. So I think the growth aspect is just very, very, very useful, and it allows this co the company to to keep investing and keep innovating as well. There's very little innovation, I think, typically in companies that are not growing. So. The valuation, again, is it's always, now I'm, I'm willing to underwrite growth because I'm willing to look at the size of these markets and where we are in the adoption curve and estimate the size of the opportunity and then what the company has in revenues, and et cetera. And it's, it, you drive, you know, it drives your, your valuation, your spreadsheet, and you do a discounted cash flow. And if you can get to a, an attractive internal rate of return, which I define as north of 20% internal rate of return, then to me, that, that's an interesting opportunity. That, to me, means undervalued. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't think, like I said, I don't think something like public cloud is, is as well understood as, as you would think. I, I know you are very tech savvy, and you, and you know what it is. Uh, but but um, it, it's, it's surprising. Um, so, and, and as far as the other public cloud providers, we do have investments in, in some of them. So we have a position in, in Alphabet, which is Google. It's, it's, um, it's our second largest position. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not uh, super excited about their public cloud, uh, uh, Google Cloud platform, because it's very small. And I question whether Google has the culture and the organizational setup to really make that push. And, and, and the reason is, let me put some nuance on it, they don't have very good enterprise sales effort. They just hired a guy now who used to work at Oracle, which is like the last guy you would imagine that Google would hire, but they hired him because the guy knows how to do enterprise sales. Amazon, surprisingly, is amazing at enterprise sales. And then the, the other company that we have a position in is, is, is Microsoft, which is surprising to me because Microsoft is like Microsoft, like, but they are firing on all cylinders. I mean, you look at their, not only the management, Satya Nadella came in, completely changed the company, and they now have this, this verve and this innovation, and you know, everything from Windows 10, which I think is, is amazing. It's really well done. A lot of things there, Microsoft Teams and all, their, uh, all the enterprise stuff, and Azure uh, is, is uh, also apparently firing all cylinders growing very fast. Their whole hardware line is incredible. I invite you to go to a Microsoft store one day when you're in the mall and check out their hardware. I think it's better than Apple's and more innovative than Apple's today. So, and the company's growing uh, very nicely and the profits are growing very nicely. So, so it's, it's a very attractive one as well. As far as Alibaba, um, I, I, I struggle with that one because it's, it's China and there's a lot of government involvement and everything. We do have a position in Tencent, which also has a public cloud. It's much smaller than Alibaba's, but Tencent to me is, is a lot easier to underwrite and understand. It's, it's, uh, for those of you who don't know, Tencent is a conglomerate in China that does, it's one of the largest gaming publishers in the world. It also has social media and it has this application called WeChat, which is literally like a consumer staple in China. You People wake up and go to bed and they're on WeChat the whole day and they do everything. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they do so much inside WeChat, payments, social media, ordering food, et cetera, so. What do you think about uh, disruptive companies that are, are cash consumer uh, as investment, like uh, Uber and Lyft yep. that are going to make uh, their appeals? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so common in general. Um, you know, there's there's good ca cash consumption and there's bad cash consumption. Uh, to give you an example, that's very easy to think about. You know, Walmart was a company that was started in the 1960s, I think, in that decade. And Walmart is a is a child of the automobile because once everybody in middle class America had a car, you could drive 
out of the way to go to this superstore. And they were a disruptive innovator. They were disrupting all those lousy general stores that had poor selection and high prices, et cetera. And Walmart, for something like 20 years, was a cash consumer. They didn't produce any free cash flow. Now, was it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, in hindsight, it was a phenomenal idea. And I don't know enough about the early history of Walmart to tell you, but I bet you that if you were there and you spoke to Sam Walton, he would tell you, listen, we're building this box. And this is the investment that we put in. We have a very high return on that investment within a year. So it's a high, you know, very fast payback. And so if that's the case, you want the company to consume cash because you want the company to take whatever cash it can and just plow back into the business. A lot of the companies, actually I'd say all the companies that we're investing in that have that, uh, that, have that problem of, of, let's say, consuming cash as they're growing, they talk a lot about their unit economics, which is very, that's exactly what you want to know, is you want to know for the cash that I'm, that I'm investing in the business, what am I getting in terms of return? And unit economics, you can think of the unit economics of the Walmart box, right? So, so that's sort of my general comment. Um, on the other hand, there are companies that consume cash and it's value destructive because maybe they're, a good example is a company spends a lot of money in sales and marketing. Some of these companies spend 50, 60, 70% of their, literally of their sales and sales and marketing expenses and they're not winning enough customers. So the payback on that sales and marketing expense is questionable. So there's also that problem. So we, it's, it's very nuanced that you have to understand it on a case-by-case -case basis. Nobody's going to ask me about Facebook. Can I ask about Facebook? <laughs> uh, how do you feel about Facebook today versus how you felt about it two years ago? And how do you think you feel about Facebook two years from now versus how you feel about it today? Yeah, so I, 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 people, two people asked me about Facebook before the meeting, and I said, actually, I wasn't going to talk about it. So I was expecting a question. Um, so Facebook, I think it's, uh, Facebook is a, is a Rorschach test. You know, the, the psychology test where you have the, butterfly. exactly, right, you have the, the smear and some people see a butterfly, somebody else sees a vase, etc. If you look at the, my Twitter feed, Facebook is, is the origin of all the world's problems, right? It's like, oh, fake news, etc. But then you go on Facebook, uh, and you, it, to me, it's just such a delightful product. It's just, uh, it, you, it's fun. You get to discover all these incredible things. And then, of course, there's Instagram. And it, it's, just, it's just, to me, a very, very delightful experience. Um, and I, I fully acknowledge the problems. And I've been very much, trust me, deep in the woods, understanding everything that's happened over the past years. I watched all the congressional testimonies. I saw all the Cambridge Analytica documents and uh, congressional hearings and all that. And, I don't know if you're referring to that at all, but probably, and data leaks and all these issues that are out in the media. Passwords in plain text. Passwords in plain text, exactly. Like, who would do that, right? Um, so, I, I, you know, part of me thinks Facebook is extraordinarily well managed. Uh, and then part of me, when something like that comes out, I think, my goodness, this must be the worst managed company in the world, right? Because who saves passwords in plain text? Um, I, I, I think that the company is a, a, a real consumer staple of the 21st century. Let's talk about the good first, and then I'll talk about the bad. It's a real consumer staple for the 21st century, meaning, it, again, it's that, it follows that definition where it's a, it's a product or service that people love. There's over 2.5 billion people using some Facebook service on a monthly basis, which is astonishing. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's got few close substitutes. Right, and it's got unregulated pricing. So Facebook makes money through advertising. And if I had the chart here, the price per uh, the the, do the revenue per user on Facebook has just been going up and up and up and up and up. You know, since since the beginning of the company, because there's a fixed number of growing, but fixed number of eyeballs on the service, and there's more and more advertisers going on Facebook. So you have this is called supply demand imbalance. There's a, big, there's a big shift now from offline to online advertising. So all those dollars are coming in. And Facebook's price, it's not that they're raising prices, they're not. It's an auction-based system. So as more people compete to get ads on Facebook, the price goes up. It's the same system that um, Google uses. So 
and, and I also attended uh, the Facebook developer conferences and, and the Oculus conference. Look, I'm, I'm very optimistic on the company. The, I, I think that the product is delightful. I think they have a very deep bench of incredible people in terms of management. Uh, financially, it is one of the most astonishing, uh, you know, incredible businesses you've ever seen. Very high margins, just gushes free cash flow. Um, and as far as product development, again, they are always inventing new things. There is now, uh, you've probably seen this recently, where on Instagram, you can start shopping on Instagram. They, they just did a closed beta and all these incredible brands like Burberry and Nike, et cetera, you, will allow you to buy products and check out directly on, on Instagram. Um, Facebook is also uh, integrating all of its chatting, uh, messaging applications and that will allow you to talk to anyone on, from WhatsApp to Messenger, et cetera. And that has implications for commerce later on. Uh, when people, for example, in India, WhatsApp is huge and people do transactions via WhatsApp. Um, and those transactions right now are, you know, there's, they don't really have a payments application, but they're going to integrate a payments application, which they're building. And then they're also doing an effort with uh, cryptocurrency, which is very interesting because payments today, and this is a whole other topic, but payments today goes through, the, they call them the rails, uh, which is these, this traditional infrastructure where, we, where you have a bank on one end and then you have a bank on the other end and then in between you've got all these, all these middle, middlemen and you've got the card networks like Visa, MasterCard, etc. If you start doing payments in cryptocurrency, it's like over the top television. You literally fly over the top of this whole infrastructure and you go from bank to bank or not even, you don't even need a bank, you just go from smartphone to smartphone. And so it has the potential to make commerce more seamless, uh, potentially a lot more secure, and uh, it has the potential to be very profitable as well. So yeah, so I, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about the company. And I think you know, Mark Zuckerberg is the archetype of the missionary guy. If you look at his, if you look at his life history, when he was in, uh, he, his dad was a dentist, he, and he built uh, the Zucknet, which was a little network inside the house that he could talk to his sisters and his dad. It was a little social network inside the house. And then when, you know, I think it was Yahoo uh, approached them to buy Facebook, this is 2005 or six, for a billion dollars. They were walking by Zuckerberg's apartment and he said, listen, and, and he had like a, you know, the mattress on the floor and the lamp and a few books. He's like, I don't, you know, money's not really my thing, you know, as you can tell, right? What I want to do is I want to build this out. I want to connect people and build more things. So I think, you know, I think that that's a very attractive quality. I also like the fact that he's very young. I like the fact that he's extremely rational, maybe, maybe too rational if you look at some of the emails that get leaked. But I, I you know, I think that, uh, I think that the company has, I see it as, uh, I see it as sort of, Microsoft in the 80s or Microsoft in the early 90s where they had that swagger. If you look at the early photos of like Bill Gates with the sweater and he's like lying down, it's kind of weird. But, um, but I think that there is a lot more optionality for Facebook even than there was for Microsoft back then. And, uh, and also they have, they've learned a lot from the history and the mistakes that other companies have made. One of which was acquisitions. So they bought Instagram and they bought WhatsApp and right, which, which maybe another company wouldn't have been uh, so open to acquisitions. They would have said, no, no, we're just going to build it internally. So sorry for the long answer. How can you try to protect yourself like uh, doing disruptive technologies, new technologies, like uh, giving you an example about BlackBerry? Yeah. A couple of years, a company really was quite popular. Yeah, so how do you protect yourself from, from disruptions and like what happened to BlackBerry? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, uh, you know, how about I answer that question in five years or 10 years? Because I don't know the answer. But what I can tell you is it's very important. It goes back to what I was talking about in terms of being open-minded. It's very important not to fool yourself, right? The easiest person to fool is yourself. And it's very important to keep uh, the finger on the pulse of, of your companies, to know what's happening not only to your companies but to the competitive environment. Um, in hindsight, when you look back at 
uh, at, there's, a, there's a very good book on, on BlackBerry, Research in Motion. There's a very good book about the rise and fall of, of, of RIM, Research in Motion. And, it's, uh, and so in hindsight, you can identify a bunch of things. You know, they were very slow to react to the iPhone. They, they, had, like, they had two CEOs and they, they worked in different offices and they weren't talking to each other and the, so the product was the product development was divorced from other parts of the business it was it was a bit of a mess so but i don't i don't know uh if if in real time it would have been as obvious because i i wasn't an investor back then so i don't know but that's something that you have to absolutely stay on top of but guess what right i mean the whole point in my my view is that you also have to stay on top of something like an old school business, like a Johnson & Johnson, like a Nestle, like you also have to stay on top of those. And so if you're gonna stay on top of your businesses anyway, you might as well be invested in the great businesses, right? Instead of the ones that are sort of mature and slow, slow growing and you know, where it's not going anywhere. By the way, um, this question about Facebook is interesting because if you look at valuations, and I wrote about this in October, I wrote a little blog post on this, because October, the markets went down a lot, but all the staples uh, either stayed flat or the stock prices went up. Staples meaning like things that are considered staples like Coca-Cola. You look at the valuation of, so Coca-Cola, by the way, sales are going nowhere, right? Carbonated soft drinks, it's just been like down, 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 volumes down for uh, over a decade. And it's just, it's just become a much worse business than it was. And, and yet, so not only does it trade, and, and with Facebook, it's easy to look at multiples because Facebook generates a lot of free cash flow. So Coca-Cola trades at a much higher multiple than Facebook, or at, or at a similar multiple than Facebook, has no growth, has really no perspective ahead of it. What are they gonna do, right? They're gonna invent like some software drink. It's like, you know, and, and Facebook is, here's Facebook growing 30% uh, sales and and so Facebook stock goes down a lot in, in, in October and Coca-Cola stock goes up and so what I think happened is is I think that there's still a mentality in the market of a sort of a flight to safety uh, where these old-school staples companies are still considered bond like in a way but I think investors are really maybe that's a short-term thing but I think who would rather own Coca-Cola in the long run over the next 20 years versus you know, uh, innovative companies. I, I think the answer is, is uh, the question answers itself. So it's really, it's really bizarre. I think there's still this mentality in the market about the safety of these old companies. No question on interest rates. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong crowd. <laughs> I have a question on. Um Two questions. One being these ideas of the 20% are, you know, at rate of return. Looking at the scale of them, looking at how, how large they are, effectively they would double say in three and a half years. Uh, being question one, you know, do, do you have a, a limit? You know, effectively, isn't that a sort of a ceiling you have? And, and the other being, what would be the bear cases? Okay, could you state the bear cases for these ideas? Or you would say, if I start seeing these sort of things happening, I, you know, I got to change my mind. Yeah. So that's a great question. So the the first question, just so I understand, you're saying that the 20% IRR it means that the stock price would would triple in a few years. Yeah. But well, what I'm suggesting, for example, let, let's let's say or, or let's double in a few years. Yeah. Right. Uh, if, let's say 800, 800 billion in three and a half years would be 1.6 trillion. Mm -hmm. then, just to give one example. Right, so here's, here's an interesting puzzle, okay, for you. And, and this is a puzzle that I struggle with as well, right? So, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of a backstory on this. There's a, there's a, there's a well-known investor called Chuck Acri, and he's got this very good long-term track, track record. And see, he's owned, you know, master, all these amazing companies. Not necessarily the software ones, but like MasterCard and cell phone towers and things like that for many, many years. And, and, and he's older, so he's been around for a long time. So I, I've, I, I ran into him in Omaha uh, last year, or last year, and we started having this conversation, and I said, and, and he told me, listen, the, the, the biggest mistakes that we've made 
by far is we sold great businesses because we thought they were fairly valued. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, because we, you know, we, we had a very strict view of valuation, we sold them, and then they kept surprising us. Right? Management, it was all, management was amazing. They kept finding new ways to grow. They kept finding new things to do. They kept finding new ways to create value, in which we were not imagining. So I'm like, OK, that's interesting. And, and then we, you know, we were talking about, uh, about this problem. So when you do, so let's say you do the underwriting. OK, so now let me pose you another puzzle, OK, which is a lot of active managers underperform the index. And there was a, a very good and short paper recently about why that is. So there's three reasons why active managers underperform. Number one is an index, let's say the S&P 500 index has 500 stocks. And let's say I randomly choose five of them to invest in. There's a very low probability as the years go by that I'm going to pick the five that are going to outperform. And there's a very, on the other hand, there's a very high probability that maybe you know, one or two stocks amongst those 500 did, had a phenomenal year and maybe doubled or tripled or something, but I did not own them. And so I end up underperforming. So, OK, so that's one problem. The second problem is bias. And, and this bias means people having these mental blocks like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to look at software. Or I'm not, you know, now uh, cannabis is an emerging technology, right? And so maybe there is an adoption curve for cannabis. I don't know. I have to be open minded about it. We don't own any cannabis investments, but that doesn't mean I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't have, I have to look at these things because. What happens if cannabis becomes a huge part of the economy, right? And we have to understand this. So, so you have to be open-minded, and, and that's another reason why people underperform. But then the third reason, I think, is the most interesting. The third reason is that people end up not writing their winners. So something goes up, and then they're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to trim it. I'm going to rebalance my portfolio. And there's a really good story about this that makes it, it, makes it obvious once you hear the story, which is, um, you, you know, Buffett wrote this thing in his letter once. He said, look, if, if, I could, if I could own a piece of the greatest basketball players in history, and then all of a sudden one of them, you know, gets uh, this amazing contract and starts playing for the Lakers, and, and he was talking about, I think he was talking about Michael Jordan or something, he starts like make, earning, making all these, uh, winning all these games and becomes more valuable. Am I going to trim my investment in Michael Jordan? No, right? That would be, that would be crazy. So why would I do that with a business that, has, that, is, that is very successful in my portfolio? So I can also argue the opposite, by the way. <laughs> right? So I can also argue why you should trim and rebalance and risk management and all that. I get it. But it's, a, it's very interesting to think about it, because if, if you were that guy holding this, this stuff for 90 years, OK, let's put it this way. If Jeff Bezos had trimmed his portfolio of Amazon stock, he wouldn't be the richest guy in the world, right? Because he'd be like, oh, this is too big of a percentage of my net worth. I have to trim it, right? So it's kind of, cr it's kind of crazy when you think of it that way. So the, the puzzle is we invest in Amazon expecting a 20% IRR. The stock goes up a lot, for example. And now if I open my spreadsheet, it says, maybe it says 15% IRR. I don't really know what it says today. OK, what do I do? Right? Do you trim a little bit? Do you rebalance? And so it's, it's a big puzzle. I am very much inclined, knowing what I know now, I'm very much inclined in letting my winners run and not making the mistakes that I've heard other people talk about, people who have been in business for a very long time. And, and I think really common sense that if, if, you know, if you're going to have this wealth creator that is always innovating and finding new ways to build wealth, I think you want to be exposed to that. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the other question? I, I think you had a second part. Stating that the, the, the arguing, as Charlie Munger would say, oh, yeah. knowing the, the bear case better than the... Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that phrase of Charlie Munger. So it's, a, it's about, you, you know, if you're going to have a strong opinion, you also have to have a very strong uh, understanding of the opposite opinion. You have to argue the opposite opinion better than the guy who's arguing the opposite opinion. So yeah, I totally agree with that. And yeah, so you, you have to understand if, and Facebook is a great example. You have to understand all the bad things that people are, are saying about it. 
and then understanding the mitigants to that. And just to give one example, this whole thing about fake news, I, you know, I actually have a, a, an issue of this, uh, I can't remember the name of the magazine, but it's a whole issue on fake news. Fake news has been around forever. There was a whole election in the United States that was won, and this is in the 1800s, during the, the days of the telegraph, because people were saying false things over the telegraph wires. So this is not a new problem, right? People are going to uh, uh, subvert any new technology to, uh, to their means, and, and we have to learn about these things. So Kevin Systrom, who's the co-founder of, of Instagram, he's no longer at Facebook, but he said, you know, I think we are in the pre-Newtonian days of, of social media. So we don't really understand the mechanics of how these things work. So we, it's a new technology, right? So we're going to learn about it. We're going to learn how to deal with it, et cetera. So you also have to let these things play themselves out. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I totally agree with you. You have to understand the bear case. Any more questions? Does anybody want beer and wine and some food? All right, let's go for it. Thank you so much.